Hey, everybody. Uh, Jan Bernackridge here with All Points Design. That's allpointsdesign.ca. And today we're taking a look at the Oregon State University Permaculture Design Pro class. This is our seventh or eighth. This is our eighth call. And we're going to be going through questions as usual. I'm just going to mute everybody. And if anybody has a new question, feel free to put it into the question and answer doc and we'll go from there. Nice to see everybody. Okay. All right. So we're going to start off with a question from Anna Maria. Um, these office hours are usually during my toddler's bedtime, so I haven't been able to make them. Totally fair. Uh, my site is full of growing knotweed, and I thought the best thing to do would be to cover the whole thing in cardboard and mulch over that. Raised beds could be used while waiting the half a year year that it needs. When I design my plants, should I design for the sheet mulch time or for afterwards? Okay, so let's talk, as usual, let's talk concept, um, let's talk patterns, and then let's talk strategies. Because uh, we're always trying to develop that designer's mind, and so much of that designer's mind has to do with understanding plant growth, understanding how to deter plant growth and understanding how then to sequence certain events. So generally pernicious, persistent pioneer plants like knotweed and others um, are, are persistent. They, they like to grow. They usually grow by rhizome and also by seed. So they have a, a double um, reproduction strategy and, you know, knotweed, knapweed, um, broom, Oh, there's so many that that folks really get frustrated by. But generally, um, sheep mulching over top of these plants tends not to kill them uh, or diminish them, only because they have very long lifespans. They put a lot of their energy into their roots. And if we just cover them up, they just kind of wait it out. Uh, and a, a colleague of mine and a friend, actually, uh, ended up having bindweed, which is similar to knotweed, um, in his backyard and mulched it and then the bindweed basically just went throughout the entire yard looking for light so while it was in a couple of spots mulched over it because some permaculturist said you should um went over the entire yard and then the entire yard was a problem so there's a couple ways to do this i think because of your site anna maria um, i would do it the way that i've listed here i have done it differently on larger scale sites and larger scale sites when i have uh, persistent pioneers that are are, are rhizome uh, reproductive. Uh, they have a rhizome reproductive approach. What I'll do is I'll till. It's one of the few times I will use tilling in the toolbox. I'll till and then I'll do what's called raking, broad scale raking with um, implements. So basically what we're doing is there's this principle where large uh, particle sizes, when you rake something, will float to the top. And this is true if you've ever had a bowl of nuts and you shake the bowl of nuts, the big nuts come to the surface. It's the same principle that's used in uh, in avalanches uh, with the inflatable suits. So that way you float to the top and you ride, you ride on the top. Um, so in this situation, I, I basically tilled, I raked, the rhizomes floated to the top. I then rake those to the side and I did what's called solarization where you end up wrapping them in silage tarpage and silage tarpage is, is roughly three, three millimeter thick, black side out. So that way the heat from the sun will bake it. And, uh, and over time, usually a year or two, it'll decompose. And then you can take that material and you can um, basically use it as organic matter. In your situation, because your situation is this really tight, and I should pull this up just so everyone can see it. It's this really tight, small area. This is an area that is kind of surrounded by all sides by building. Here we go. This is a great image of it. It's a very tight little spot, right? It's very, very tight. Um, I don't know if I would do that. Uh, it's also, you don't have a lot of space and a lot of, uh, of, of, of ability there. So what I would do instead in that situation is I would, when it's in flower, which is normally when plants are at their most vulnerable because they've expressed so much of their life potential, they put it into flower. Uh, and as they're just starting to form seed, you don't want seed finished and fully formed, um, but you just want it just to start, you know, just after it's flowered and it's slowly closing, it's been pollinated and it's moving to seed, uh, you scalp it. So basically you take a weed whacker 
um, a string mower. And you basically scalp the ground. You basically go back and forth. What this does is all of the Mary stems that are coming up from the plant roots are open. And so the xylem and the phloem, the phloem's open. And so if you spray a high strength agricultural vinegar, which is usually anywhere between eight and 12%, um, in Canada, it's called Munger's vinegar. Uh, and you basically put it into a little sprayer and you basically just spray the area. And what that does is that vinegar comes down into the, the plant roots and you slowly start to kill it. Now, and this works for a number of different pernicious plants. Um, because they're so persistent, sometimes you have to do this two, three, four times. And then generally in between each one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put down, again, that three mil polytarp. Um, I'm going to put it over top and it's going to kill out uh, those roots because they're going to get zero sunlight. So basically they have to expend all of the energy they've left in their root. And over time, you're slowly going to get them out. You could, of course, do, um, you could do a, a tilling and whatnot, but I think what you've shown me in terms of access, I don't think you'd be able to get a BCS tractor in there where these are these walk behind tractors. And I think it's, it's a lot of work for such a small area. Um, the other option, if you didn't want to like remove it, is you could mulch with um, something like a really heavy um, geotextile. And so geotextiles, woven geotextiles like uh, DeWalt Sunbelt product, they're interlaced geo-woven textiles. And so basically they allow water through, but they don't allow sunlight. This would not be as advantageous because you wouldn't necessarily be killing the plant. You would just be starving it over time. And eventually it would, it would find a small enough stem to come through eventually, but you could do that and then put in your raised beds uh, and then go from there. Um, but generally I think your, your cardboard mulching would be problematic uh, and would probably increase the knotweed versus not. Now, let's say you did have a situation where this was a good idea. Um, usually when I mulch, or pardon me, when I do mulch gardens, I'll put down cardboard, and then I'll put down two to six inches of decomposing horse manure. It's one of my favorite ways to have an instant garden. And then on top of that, I'll do like two to three inches of straw. And what's great about that is that the annuals can be planted in the manure. Basically, you just kind of make a hole in the straw. You put in your annual, either seed or seedling. You kind of move the mulch a little bit around it. And if you do have perennials, you can basically move the mulch aside, cut an X in the cardboard, kind of fold the, the flaps of the X underneath, dig your hole out, put your perennial in. If you want to, you can kind of unfold it a little, little bit so that way it's around. And then you bring the mulch close, but not touching the stem. This is really important for anybody who's never mulched before. A lot of people will mulch directly beside the stem. And basically what you're doing is you're, is you're introducing a vector for disease because now mulch gets wet, mulch has insects, mulch has life in it. It's touching the bark. And now there's a lot of um, penetration points potentially. It's, it's amazing in Central and Latin America, they do this all the time and their trees have such a shortened lifespan. I don't, I don't quite understand it. It's one of those things I'm digging into, but uh that's what I would do. I know, Anna, that you're on the call. Did you have any follow-up questions or does that answer your question? Hi. Yeah, I was um, I was wondering if I go with the idea of putting the tarp down, um, how would I go about my plant design? Is raised beds on top of the tarp kind of the only thing available for me until all the knotweed is dead underneath? I would say so. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so yeah. much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for the question. Yeah. And nice to have you on Office Hours. Um, sorry that it interrupted with toddler time, but that takes precedence. Uh, cool. So let's go on to Sheena. Sheena from the News Bay, Canada. I'm struggling with the term patterns in the plant system design part of this week's assignment. Is that like the assemblage of plants? So a pattern in this context is a term that encompasses observations about influences and sectors and energies on the site. So one of the things that we see in that assignment, I'm just going to pull up the template here, is that when we're talking about patterns in a lot of these examples, we're talking about this is a, a cold and drafty site, or this is a area that gets uh, water pooling or ponding, um, or this may be an area where we have a view corridor that we want to keep or a view corridor that we want to um, 
we want to interrupt. So when we take a look at some of these examples on the on the right side here, I'm just going to punch in a little bit here. So we've got a couple of different elements. And I think, um, who was this? Was this Lauren? I think this was Lauren. Yeah. So Lauren kind of mixed the two here, putting the patterns um, on here. And that's fine. You know, you can you can move into strategy. Strategy would be like an edible windbreak. But basically, a view screen is a pattern. Capture over land flow is a pattern. Cold season solar bowl is a pattern. And if we go back to the top and take a look at the previous student examples. Huh. One, oh, there we go. And we take a look for Adria's. There she is. Adria did a pretty phenomenal job of her plant design and final design. I highly recommend folks check out her assignment. Because uh, what she ended up doing was being very specific about the patterns. And then it, her design became very obvious to her. It's one of the things that um, I really appreciated about the way that she went about this. is She was able to see and observe the major patterns. And then from there, she was able to jump into it. So generally, there were patterns and proposed design patterns on the large scale. And so she had all these different areas. And then as we got to the small scale, I'm just going to punch in here. As we got into the small scale, there were some patterns that she was considering the view coming up the, hot, uh, the drive, consider the view entering the, the driveway, consider screen between farmhouse and living room, maximize solar access, capture overland flow. And then the strategies were the implementations. It was, I'm going to do a swale trail system. I want to uh, create a solar bowl. I want to have a fenced corral. So patterns are more observational influences. Um, observed influences, sectors, different aspects that you're trying to design for, and strategies are the specific de design elements. So they could be um, hygge culture, they could be um, agroforestry. Uh, one of the reasons we designed the assignments this way, and and it, it's it's based out of how I design, is it's very easy for students, especially in permaculture, because permaculture highlights a single thing and it becomes sort of a panacea it becomes this holy cow that people get really excited about and then when they design they go through the permaculture store and they just grab something off the shelf like a herb spiral it's kind of the largest sin i've ever seen and they grab that herb spiral and they just plunk it into their site without understanding what a herb spiral is um, what it requires what it needs and so this way of designing is trying to get you to think, okay, so what are all the influences that are coming from my microclimate assignment, my water assignment, uh, from local ecology, from my sector analysis? What are all these pieces plus what the client wants, what the regulations are, what the inherent characteristics of the site are? And then what are those patterns that I'm designing for? So that way they're right in front of you. So that way, as you're looking at this, you're going, okay, well, I need to do these things. And here's what I've learned thus far about permaculture and regenerative land design. So what is the implementation that would be good here that I could potentially mentally try out and see if it fits and then probably have to redesign at least two or three times because I didn't quite get the, the pattern right. I didn't quite understand that pattern. And then that implementation, as you're putting it in, okay, now how is it being watered? How How is the, the layout of the plants going to look? What does maintenance look like? And this actually gets into Michael's question, you know, really ensuring that you have good access into your areas. And generally, I try to keep uh, three feet of access so you can hold a wheelbarrow and move it around really easily. And sometimes we have to narrow that access over time. But all of those different elements, and we could even say patterns again, which is confusing. You know, patterns are basically just uh, an, an elemental representation of something that we're looking at that we can tend to see over and over again. It's never exactly the same, but from moment to moment, the the different patterns will rhyme. Like there'll be there'll be similarities between them. So, in short, the way in this assignment we're using the word patterns is what are the observed influences from all the previous assignments? What do they look like on site? Where are they located? And then a strategy is what you're going to uh, design into that site to address those patterns. Sheena, does that make sense? It's 
going to check if Sheena's here. I thought I saw her. Okay, good. Awesome. Uh, there we go. Just to, uh, can I just, can I also um, just explain how I understand that? <laughs> sure. Um, so it would, uh, for example, would the, if you've noticed prevailing winds are drying the landscape, well, that would be a pattern. A strategy would be a windscreen. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, well said. Um, and then your third question here, Sheena was, uh, can, should you fill a contour swale with gravel rocks? So you can, um, but generally, you know, if, if, if we're creating swells, we generally leave them open unless we need additional functionality, this whole idea of stacking functions. So if we need additional functionality and especially on small scale sites, uh, we'll create swale trails and these are swales or, um, sometimes it's not even a berm. We're just creating a ditch, a level ditch. And in it, we are putting wood chips. And the way we usually do this is that if we've got our, our indentation, we'll mound up and high in the center because over time it'll decompose. And generally you walk on the center. So it's important to keep the center high or else what'll happen is if you have it flat, it'll become an indentation. So it's generally just a, a wear and tear thing to look into the future. The great thing about creating swale trails, if you do it that way, or if you take like a downspout and then take um, piping, we in Canada use something called big O piping, which is black corrugated plastic, which comes in like three and six inches and can be perforated. As we'll take that downspout and we'll put it kind of in the center of the swale trail in and around this mulch. And so that way that water then comes into the, the swale trail, then seeps into the ground and continues on down that swale. The great thing about this, uh, because we have organic matter and water, is where there's water and where there's organic matter, there's life. And so we can seed these uh, swale trails or, or filled swales with earthworms uh, naturally they'll find that space anyways but we can increase that successional process by bringing in earthworms and it's amazing how quickly soil is built in these swale trails so our swales can actually become soil farms we can build soil out of these swales and they become worm farms because we can bring in our worms and i've seen some people uh, compost in these swale trails if you have burrowing animals if you have cats if you have dogs if you have rodents if you have opossums that can be problematic so Generally, I don't advise that, but I've seen some people do it. Um, and then depending on the mulch material you put into that trail, um, you can inoculate that with uh, mushrooms, uh, depending on if you're using, you know, things like alder chips and wood chips with which um, saprophytic decomposing mushrooms like uh, Western Garden Giant love. And so we did this uh, a lot in uh, Western Canada uh, in the temperate zone, we tended to create a whole bed of mushrooms. That was our pathway. And I remember when students say, well, then what do you do when the mushrooms flush? You pick them. <laughs> that's dinner. That's lunch. That's breakfast. You know, you've got this incredible, um, system that works. So on the other side, you can fill it with gravel and rocks. The only question is why would you do that? Like what's, what's the value of that? Is that to have a a level surface to walk upon or you know what is in your context the reason why you might do that i'm curious um so i was thinking of uh, like you said running the perforated pipe like through the the swale but it we need to be able to walk on it like gotcha. you said so i wasn't sure i i would would think that if you mulched and as it turned into soil that those perforated pipes would clog Mm -mm. So, so most of the, per the big O piping comes with a sock. So there's usually like this um, geotextile around it. And so basically as it decomposes, uh, generally the inside of the big O becomes free and clear because it's, it's got some resistance to infiltration from roots. Uh, the only thing I'd be conscientious about uh, with that process, and this is what happens with French drains and uh, septic systems, is that if it doesn't have resistance to fine root hairs, you'll find that trees will grow into them. And so normally we're just using that just to convey the water from that collection point. So maybe be at the downspout or something, and then into the swale. And then we're letting the formation of that swale take it further along. So what I could imagine is, if uh, 
if you were walking along or if you had a larger vehicle or you know a bigger uh, bigger vehicle on site that you were moving things around i may do a section uh, with rock or i may just put wood down and have like a small traversable bridge that can take you up and over Okay, so just to confirm, would you run the, the perforated pipe the whole length of the swale or would you just sort of like feed it into the swale? Usually just feed it in unless you're actively trying to like branch the water out. The problem with big O piping is that once it hits that first two to three feet or meter, um, when that water comes, it's kind of like a flush. So it doesn't necessarily travel very long down that area. So you have to be conscientious of sometimes grading that, that pipe. Uh, so that way, when it gets into that area, it actually has a little bit of travel before it spreads out. So I would, I would normally just put it in, you know, a couple of feet or a meter into the swale and then let the swale do the job. Okay. Can I ask one last question? Go for it. What is your preferred? Um, so I'm just in the process of finishing up my, um, my raised beds in my in my garden mm -hmm. um and it's an old garden and so i feel like i'm building rome where i'm just sort of like building on top of the ruins <laughs> um but what is your preferred material for pathways I'm, I'm trying to decide whether i should do like landscape fabric and just mulch over top or just do cardboard and mulch over top i have an infinite i've got to hook up with the local arborist so i have an infinite supply of wood chips okay so this comes down to, to management and labor. So generally, if these are areas that are high traffic yeah. and you're trying to cut down on labor, um, I tend to line my pathways with geo-woven textile. And then uh, this is the heavy duty stuff. This is like the DeWilt Sunbelt 250, 300. It's, it's tight. You can pass it down to your next generation of farmers. It usually lasts um, 10 years in direct sunlight under uh, under some type of material or mulch, mulch, it can last longer. So if you're worried about that, I might put that underneath or I might put cardboard underneath if you want something that will decompose and you don't have to worry about like removing material and, and lifting it up. Um, but if you're worried about having to maintain your pathways, I would do cardboard knowing that within two or three years there's going to be penetration. And so you're going to have the expression of that landscape come up. But if it were I, what I would do is over whatever time you have, I would do what's called a, a spent seed bed process where you basically tarp your entire area with, again, silage tarpage that's three mil, black on one side, white on the other, tarp the whole area, and usually do it in the growing season after uh, the winter snow has melted or after the winter rains have happened. So that way the ground does become saturated. And then what I do with this is I tarp this whole area off and I usually leave it up until the first week of planting or, you know, when you do this, you warm up the soil so you can actually push your planting date earlier. But generally I want that tarp to be there later. What happens is all of the seeds and the roots and whatnot that's in that soil express themselves, hit that plastic and die out. And so what you're doing is you're, uh, you're, you're expressing the soil seed bank over and over again. So that way it expresses and dies, it expresses and dies, expresses and dies. So that way when you go to plant or when you go to build your garden, generally the weed pressure, pressure is dramatically reduced. So what I do with these three big hookah cultures that were off of my shop is I take off my plastic in the winter, allow the beds to totally soak up. And then the moment they're free and the plastic is pliable because plastic and cold can sometimes be problematic. I then cover them completely. And what happens is I don't have to weed these beds almost at all over the summer because I'm using this, this stale seed bed technique. So I would do that. And then when you're ready to build your garden, whenever that happens, um, I would then be conscientious about what kind of uh, weed barrier I was going to put in those those pathways. And then if you're going to put wood chips on top or if you're just going to walk on the geotextile, just depending on the amount of labor you want to put into it. But that's the way I would do it. Okay. I have a real quick question about the earthworms that you mentioned. Sure. Um, in my area, earthworms are technically not native. I, I think because of the ice the glaciers that came down that created the Great Lakes. Mm -hmm. um, but there's still earthworms everywhere. 
Um, so I wonder what, if you have any thoughts on like the invasive issue of using earthworms that are mm -hmm. technically non-native. Yeah. Yeah. This gets into the question of invasive, native, non-native, naturalized, this, this whole conversation and question. And um, Dow Ryan uh, put together a great book um, on, in, on invasive um, species and really plums into the philosophy of it and the conversations and the back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you my quick summary. Um, outside of ecology, ecology doesn't care about our feelings, our philosophy, our morality. <laughs> and mm -hmm. this, this was a wonderful place I got to because it was one of my major questions when I came into this work is, well, what should be here? That big question. And generally when we're talking about invasives and natives and whatnot, um, that conversation has to come with a time period. When I take a look at British Columbia, you know, there were date palms here at some point. And a lot of the speciation that we're looking at here would be considered invasive or non-native at some point within the history of when we're here. Mm -hmm. When we take a look at food plants, food plants, by all intents and purposes, the tomato should be categorized as an invasive. It's not native to North America. There's really, when we take a look at food plants, there's like three or four that are native that we eat in, in any sort of regularity. There's, there's others foods that uh, we don't necessarily eat all the time, but is food that, that are native to North America. So my piece about native, non-native, invasive, all the rest of it is weeds are just, and the concept of weeds are basically just racism against plants. It's, we don't like them where they are. So when we take a look at the earthworm, which isn't native to North America, but is widespread now, as is Apis mellifera mellifera, the honeybee. Um, it's really about how do I do the best I can with the tools around me to reduce my overall cost of being on this planet to the ecology and the beings around me. And at the same time, take a stance that I'm going to do the best I can with what I have around me. So I don't really worry about the fact that earthworms are not native to North America. Um, they're here. Uh, you could call them a hardworking immigrant. So I'm going to use them as best I can to increase the soil fertility around me. So that way my food footprint is a lot smaller because of the way that earthworms work, what they eat, their castings, earthworm juice that comes off of them. The fact that they're an apex predator, predator that's naturalized within the soil food web ecosystem. And I take that approach conceptually and philosophically to all of my work with the caveat that the burden of design is on the designer. So if we introduce something, if we introduce a non-native that is advantageous, usually called a weed, to an area that's on us. So mm -hmm. if I bring in comfrey to an area and I don't use something called the Bocking 14 sterile seed comfrey by using uh, a seed version, or if I'm bringing in something that I love, which is um, Eleagnus multiflora and Eleagnus umbellata, these are the gumi plants, which in places in South, uh, South, uh, not South America, but the Southern United States, that when they get into riparian areas, they just take over. I have to be very conscientious of how I plant and where I plant, knowing the full life cycle of these elements. But at the same time, I want to reduce my footprint, my ecological footprint on this planet while improving or supporting the ecology around me. So for me, I use them, but I'm conscientious of where they're from. I'm conscientious of their place of origin, conscientious of their spread. And as um, I don't know who it was, it might've been Michael um, was speaking about this week's assignment about <coughs> local ecology. The more we learn about local ecology and what naturally is here, the more we become conscientious that seeds, beings, people, plants, animals spread the world over, not just by humans, but by other plants and animals and weather patterns. And so we do the best we can without becoming um, too fundamentalist about it is my approach. So uh, take that with a grain of salt. <laughs> Thanks, Corey. Appreciate it. Okay. 
So Michael, when we tear our slopes, how much weight do we need for the wall? I'm thinking about a one meter high horizontal slab piled high so that the plants and insects can live between the crevices, but not so sure about the structural integrity, especially during monsoon season when a lot of landslides happen. So Michael, I worked with a couple of um, civil engineers once and they have tables and spreadsheets and a whole process of duty of care when it comes to designing of terraces for structural integrity. And so you can go that route and you can um, engage them and, and query them and pay them for the consulting fees of understanding. Uh, they'll do a geotech report on your soil type. They'll do um, a laminar slide. They'll do a dispersion soil test. There's all of these professional ways of addressing what is the slide potential and weight potential and pressure potential of your soil. And then what is the solution for that in terms of the shear tensile and, and weight of the wall that you do. From what I've seen of your site, I would be pretty confident uh, to take material and to lean it back into the slope as long as it's towed into the soil below and as long as you have ways of managing water upslope. So if that slope, when it rains and rains large in your monsoon season, if that slope has running water that comes all the way down, I'd be conscientious with my terraces to basically make them flat as possible to backgrade them, and then to make sure that there were moments where potentially that water could collect and maybe even have like a, a, a rock lined um, dry stream, excuse me, dry stream bed that could then course from one terrace and could come down to the other, just so that way there was a relief valve to say for overland flow on each of these terraces, just so that way it, it had that look. The cool thing about doing that is it looks really beautiful because it has this you know, almost wabi-sabi way of looking at it where it's not just a band of rock, it's actually some interesting, more mosaic pattern um, of rock that goes down. Uh, but if you had those big slabs, I would probably do it that way. I tend to use smaller brick-like elements and somebody asked this question this week, uh, they had a big long driveway and they're talking about cutting up the driveway into urbanite. Uh, and then using those chunks of urbanite, which is like concrete or asphalt, and then using them as building blocks to build up. And generally, those tend to be very strong retaining walls. Um, so I'm not a civil engineer. I don't play one on the internet. And uh, if it was that small of a project, I would probably just use my experience of the site and develop a certain way of developing these terraces that made sense. Or I would then, if I was worried about it, I would engage um, a uh, civil engineer to come and take a look at it and give me some sense of that. Does that make sense? Sorry, Michael, I can't hear you, but I see you've unmuted. Just going to pop out and see... Uh... No, I still can't hear you. Sorry, mate. <laughs> yeah, it's still nothing. Can anybody else hear him or is it just me? Mm -mm. No. Okay. Sorry about that, Michael. No. Okay. So something to do with it. Okay. Does that, does that help answer the question? Yeah. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Perfect. Um, let's get on to your next one. So question number two, I want to cut down a large tree that lives on the steepest part of the slope behind my house. What are some things I should be careful of in regards to landslides? Should I just leave the root in ground and maybe cover it with soil like a hygge culture? So definitely leave the, the root in the ground because it's helping to knit the soil and be ready to support the plant afterwards with additional yeah. deep. I'm just going to mute folks. You, Corey, there. Um, uh, and then cover, pardon me, um, and then plant deep-rooted perennial plants so that way there's there's more uh, roots that are kind of taking that up. And I may even do that before I cut down that that tree. Um, you 100% could put soil over it, and that would help to decompose it. That's that's totally fine. Um, help, help me out, everybody. Have we talked about live staking in this class yet? 
Yeah, we have. Okay, cool. Great. All right. So, uh, oh, demo guild layer. Yeah, what are some ways to lay out guilds? I'm having a hard time because I'm not sure how deep in the canopy smaller plants should go. Great question. So this will be a, a demo about um, how to design guilds or how, how I design guilds. So I'm just going to put it down here. So generally when I design guilds, and this is what I've done for years, is I usually want to have an aesthetic component, but I also want to have a functional component at the same time. So the way that I do it, and I'm not saying this is right, but it is the way that I've done it for years, is I tend to create um, it's kind of three areas. So if we've got our main you know, key species tree that we're designing around and we've got our trunk in the middle, I tend to have three areas that I focus on. I tend to have you know, a growing area here, a growing area here, and a growing area here. And what this does is it allows at least three points of entry into the guild for management, for access, for harvest, for basically anything I need to do. One of the major mistakes that students make when they're designing guilds is they tighten everything up and they make it very tight. So generally, these are kind of three growing areas. And if I'm in this area and I'm, I have a good idea of the site and the slope and everything else, and I know that um, that uh, you know north is, let's say, this way, and so south is this way in the northern hemisphere, so this is where my sun is coming from, now I have a sense of microclimate. And so with microclimate, I can start to think, well, if this is the sunny side and this is the shady side, I can then further divide my plants. Now, because years ago, I was not very aware about aesthetic design, um, but had the opportunity to work with some great designers who really schooled me in this idea of aesthetic design, I started to work with what's called clumping. So I clump in threes, fives, and sevens. So generally, if there's a you know a plant on this side, I'm generally working with three plants nice and close. Now, because I'm more focused almost always in my personal work and my personal growing with production, I want to produce a lot of food. I want to produce a lot of material for fiber and fodder and dyes and all the rest of that. I tend to work in rows. I tend to like everything very rectilinear so that way I can go and manage things very easily. Some point, some po people like wandering around the garden, having a little bit here and a little bit there. If that's you, that's a personal choice. If that's your clients, that's a personal choice. I'm telling you how I do it. So generally I like to have everything together. So some point people might put like some strawberries here and some strawberries over here. But generally if I would, if I'm designing a guild, I'm going to put all my strawberries in one place. And usually as I'm taking a look at the canopy, I'm trying to make sure that pretty much everything is close to that drip edge. So that drip edge is the area that comes down from the side of the tree. So we've got the sort of drip edge that comes down here and then lands on these areas all around here. So that means it's going to get a little bit of sloughage when it comes to, um, or, or overspill. Now, when we have all these plants together, and we're taking a look here on the side, um, you know, we're gonna have this little clumping nature of strawberries down here. But if you look at it aesthetically, it's kind of like one layer and a top layer and a whole bunch of space in between. And if you need to see past this tree, that's fine. But if you don't, this is an opportunity to start to work with heights. So generally I like doing columnar flowers or some, some small bushes or branches or things of that nature. In my climate, it's things like, Yosta berry or currants or things like that. So generally, you know, having a, a nice big bush here, uh, definitely gummies for me because I like that gummies provide nitrogen. So I tend to put at least a nitrogen fixer as a shrub layer and one or two nitrogen fixers as a ground cover. And this way I've got multiple nitrogen fixers that help out my tree. Generally, if you're being assessed by me, um, I'm going to tell you to put in a nitrogen fixer at each level. Now that I've got this sort of mid layer, I'm going to start thinking about, well, what about these vertical layers that may be a little bit more perennial? And so I really like doing columnar flowers, things like hollyhock. Um, so I'll tend to put, you know, a couple of these in here and then I'm kind of missing this layer down here. So then I might start to think about some ground cover plants or something that I might be able to put in here. So I can put in a couple of uh, ground covers, and then I've got those hollyhocks kind of, again, in a clump, three, four, five, something like that. And so here we can kind of see how this might look from 
uh, cross-section view, and then how this looks at a plan view. So you can kind of get a sense of, of how that's designed. And then as we're moving back, um, we're kind of getting into the westerly side. Again, when we take a look at sun, southerly is the most powerful, westerly is the second, easterly is the third, and then bounce light that comes from the north is the least powerful sunlight. So this is kind of our big sunny spot. This is our second sunny spot, and this is kind of our more shady spot. So I'm going to I'm going to place those plants uh, as needed. And as you take a look at the resources, there's the plant data, natural capital plant database, there's plants for a future. There's all of these different resources to go and research the plants and understand design. Now, a lot of you are going to be frustrated that it takes so much work to design. That is a very natural response. It takes a long time to understand plants and how they work and all the rest of it. But generally, if you're working with this pattern of design, um, it works out really well because then you can put yourself into this site and you can get a sense of, okay, well, if I'm X tall um, and this is generally how I am on this site, then I, I have a sense now of my spacing in this and how I might manage it and how it might look. So generally that's how I design my guilds um, and the plants and the spacing and all the rest of it is completely aesthetically driven or production driven. And if I was doing this on um, a large scale process, uh, so if I was designing this, let's say for kind of like this drawing, I want to keep it. So I'm going to see if I can just move my face out of the way and then kind of come up here. So if I was doing this and I'll do this sort of in miniature and I was thinking more of production scale, I'd be conscientious about mature heights and mature canopy spreads, making sure that we have a, a solar analysis. And I talked about that initially in one of our our conversations is that the, those solar angles really give me a sense of you know, how how much space do I have to give between these trees so that way I've got full solar spacing. And this is very much what um, Stefan Stobanowski of Miracle Farms does, is he does what's called a nap planting guide. And so nap planting guide and the species don't matter, nap, N-A-P, and then N-A-P. Just gonna put the other tree in there so we have this totally done up NAP NAP. So basically we have a nitrogen fixer, apple plum pear. These species can be anything. They don't have to be apple plum pear. But this nitrogen fixer apple plum pear makes make sure that there's a nitrogen fixing tree that's supporting two trees to its left. And this nitrogen for fixing tree is supporting two trees to its left. And then underneath that, he ends up doing a fair number of shrubs on both sides, depending on their light requirements and soil requirements. And then underneath that, he ends up doing a number of smaller shrubs or ground cover or things of that nature or herbaceous herbs that he used for medicine. This is again, Stefan Stobanowski, Miracle Farms over in Quebec, Canada. And this is a brilliant way of designing broad scale rows for, let's say, a, a small scale orchard, an acre or two. Um, and then his rows, each of his rows are harvested at the same time. So whatever speciation he's using here, that speciation is uh, all harvested at the same time. Because at some point, if you're managing a landscape, labor matters and time matters. So this is a great design element and process that really helps with that design conversation about how do I take a guild and put it into a row or a full agricultural system. And then we move up into silver pasture and agroforestry, well, agroforestry, which silver pasture is a part of, and then larger scale trees and larger scale landscapes. So uh, Mike, that's generally how I design my guilds. Did you have any follow-up questions about that? Or does anybody else have a follow-up questions about guilds while we're here? Just can check the chat. Hi. Um, oh, there's I, Anna Maria. I, okay, good. It did go through. Um, I was wondering, is a guild um, always centered around something like a tree or uh, what is basically the scale that it can be centered around? Yeah, great question. So a guild is generally, you know, two or more species that are complementary to each other that create an ecological system. So they have functionality to help each other. A mentor of mine, uh, Richard Walker, said a guild can be two or more stories. So they could be ground cover, small shrub, shrub, large shrub, small tree, medium tree, large tree, vine, um, 
fungus, root. It could be any of those, but you know, two or more elements that are in combination. And the reason why a guild became a thing is in response to monocropping. So instead of having an entire field and farm of corn, which generally I would still do if I had to produce a lot of corn, but then the guild concept would actually become a concept in time, which has to do with rotational planting and refeeding and rest of a site. So a guild is like two or more species and doesn't have to be around a tree. It could be around a bush, could be around a perennial plant that you want to support or create with. So uh, definitely doesn't have to be just around a tree, but typically that's how it's thought of. Great question. Great question. Any other questions? Okay, awesome. Um, I'm very impressed with my Zoom annotated drawing. I'm getting better. Okay, let's pop up. Bum -ba -dum -ba -dum -ba -dum. Leave the roots demo guild. Is there an effective, efficient way to do a polyculture for a vegetable garden or having vegetables completely domesticated or better off cultivated as a monocrop? Completely dependent on your management. Oh yeah, this is my answer. So um, going back to style, um, there's individuals like John Jevons and Zach Lokes and Jean Martin Fortier and Curtis Stone that all have a different approach to integrated gardening and management. And so, you know, the typical permaculture garden has everything everywhere, looks like a jungle, looks like a forest, which is fine. Um, except when you get to maintenance or when you get to mass harvest or mass processing. So in my garden, I generally have a little bit of a forest in my hoogles and a little bit of forest at the end of my garden. But in terms of row cropping, I will have a little bit of companion planting at the ends. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll do a center line of something tall, and then I'll do lines of different uh, annual plants on either side. Um, but I generally go with row crops and I, I generally don't... Uh, I don't do a lot of integration. Um, when we take a look at John Jevons or others, they will tend to like interplant. And I did this for the first couple of years. I interplanted things like parsley and kale and spilanthes underneath. And what's so amazing is you learn about microclimates right away. The kale would create this, and it, you don't think of it, but you know, kale is this beautiful plant, leafy green, really good for you. And underneath it created this humid environment that then ha attracted aphids that went after my Spilanthes plants, which I used to create herbal tinctures. And that was frustrating on the picking and the harvesting of Spilanthes, but I had an early frost and all the Spilanthes plants underneath this canopy of kale didn't freeze. Okay, so we've got this, this, this give and take. So I'm definitely not the person to learn from when it comes to interplanting, I would definitely uh, send you along to Zach Lokes, who wrote uh, the Permaculture Market Garden, um, or others who like to do that interplanting to the point to where, for me, it would be very frustrating to go and harvest everything. Uh, looks beautiful, looks sort of jungle-like, but it's a lot of labor to go and find all these different things. So when it comes to annual gardens, I do rows or half rows, I do companion plantings on the end, usually things like nasturtium or calendula, things that attract insects um, or dissuade insects I don't want. And then usually I'm using 25 to 50 foot rows because in Canada, most of our materials are sized that way. So I just have a standard unit that then I can calculate food products of. So we created this amazing food uh, course called uh, Family Food Security. Uh, my uh, colleague, uh, Kakasimo Isquith, um, who's a Métis woman in Northern Alberta. And it's a, it's a great course, highly recommend it for anybody who's focused on food security. And basically we go through the process of helping you with spreadsheets to understand how much food does my family eat? And then how many seeds does that require? How many row feet does that require? How many cans, jars, and storage spaces does that require? And then how to go about growing all that food. So if you're interested in that process, highly recommend that course. Go to regenerativeliving.online. Take a look at Family Food Security Self-Paced. We're not going to run a live course this year. We may next year, um, but I would I would go at it that way. Um, and then you wanted some conversation about your design. We're at 10.50, folks. We're definitely going to run long. 
There's been lots of questions this week, which is great. It takes a lot longer to do. Okay, so this is your design process. Got it. Cool. So, uh, you know, generally I would I would tilt these all back a little bit, a couple of degrees, just so that way they have an angle of rest and repose. Just like you've done, I would definitely anchor them into the ground. Um, as we talked about in, in my feedback, I would make, you know, platforms and areas that have that. Um, this doesn't give us much to work with. This may be like a pollinator area. So I would, you know, with that little space, um, and this is a meter meter 0.16 so yeah it's tall enough to work meter 1.6 yeah so it's tall enough to work so this may be a great place to put uh, depending on where your kitchen is this may be a great place to put your your culinary herbs that would like a really warm area that's the nice thing about doing, using stone for terraces it'll get really hot so these may be your your times your savories uh your your um yeah your herbs and your spices your basils your oreganos things like that and you've created this area and i just want to check in Michael, I'm pretty sure that each of these is is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, so each one of these is a meter. So basically, this is a two and a half meter terrace, or basically around seven-ish feet, which is great. Um, so yeah, this is a great place to uh, probably put a pathway in the middle, have a nice hot growing zone here and a growing zone here, um, knowing that you can access uh, this area. Uh, be conscientious of how you're going to access this area. So what I might do is I might push this a little bit back. Um, so that way I've got more space here to work. I might push this a little bit back. So I have some spacing here. And like I said before, I'd probably do what's called a back graded swale and, or a terrace. And a back graded terrace basically is a way to, instead of going perfectly flat, you're doing a little bit lower down. So that way when it does rain, you have the opportunity to um, come in here and there's a little bit of collection of water. And then what I might do is down the way uh, what I'll do is I'll do sort of a three-dimensional draw here. Uh, get the old black. There we go. So let's say this becomes three-dimensional. So these are our rock walls. These are our rock walls. These are our, our areas. So what might happen is you might see that there's a collection of water. So I might just put like a little dry stream bed here, leave a gap between your big boulders, and then have a way for this water to kind of overflow and come down and overflow and come down. Again, that's if... Um, from your monsoonal rays, you see quite a bit of, of overland flow. But um, I think that would look uh, pretty beautiful on your site. It'd be be a long time to work it and working with big rock uh, takes a lot out of you. I did it for a couple of years with a dry stack stone mason, but uh, it looks beautiful and uh, it'll be a piece that you know will be there for uh, a long time. And, I, and you're definitely in the culture that appreciates that. So I, uh, I like your, your terracing. Like I said, that's kind of the planting I would do. Uh, I would do a back graded swale, a uh, back graded terrace, um, have to kind of two planting zones, probably down the center could be your walkway. It's also a safety piece because this is a meter, meter point one. So it's, it's got a little bit of a drop. Might move this back a little bit to have some space here. I might move this back a bit, but yeah, great. Really good to see. I'm looking forward to seeing how that all pans out. Great question. Okay. Let's uh, go back to our questions. Oh, that's the other class, this class. My first time farming, and the only way I can think of irrigating my site is via hose from faucet. This method can only water one area at a time. Any recommendations on uh, irrigation schedule and techniques to cover all this land during droughts? Yeah. So generally, uh, on an urban site, what I like to do, oh, nice, starting to see your design come together, um, is, and this gets into irrigation design, is generally I'll, I'll do uh, a zoned irrigation design. And so... Um, there's the faucet. Well done. So coming out of here, I might do a control box um, that also has an irrigation timer. And I might run lines, main lines. These are usually inch lines that we run out. Um, it's funny. Canada is funny. We were metric and imperial. So I might have a controller box here and then have a line that runs out here for this area. And then I'm going to change colors just to show the different areas. And then a line that runs out here. This would be a, a zone in irrigation. You can read more about zonation and then maybe a line that runs out here and then maybe a line, let's pick a different color, orange, purple, uh, purple, purple, and then maybe a line that comes out here. Um, and then from this, you can run smaller drip lines or sprayers, all depending on, on what makes sense in your, your situation. 
but then you could run like single lines out from here uh, to your bait raised garden beds. And then you could run little spaghettis um, in here. And then you could run lines out here. And I was very much, uh, oh, I'm just going to water with a hose. And then once you get into the idea of being able to do it in such a way that uh, you don't, you don't need that. Um, it becomes really fast, fast, fantastic. So I might do like th three or four zones. Um, Rainbird creates pretty good splitters and control boxes. And basically what happens is it will then go through zone one at a certain time per day, zone two at a certain time per day, zone three at a certain time per day, zone four. You can do it multiple times a day at lower watering volumes, or you can do it every other day. Uh, you can turn the whole system off if you're getting into a rainy season. Um, you can pause it. Generally, you want to create a box for your controller. Um, sometimes temporary solutions become long-term mistakes. And uh, I was running around putting together this new garden once, put the controller box underneath a black bucket so that way it could be protected by rain. We had our heat dome a couple of years ago, got up to like 53 degrees Celsius in Canada, and I fried the controller, just like totally melted. Uh, I took it apart and like the electronics were toast. So definitely make a little box for it. Keep it off the ground if you can. Keep it in a shady spot, a place where maybe it can get a bit of wind. Um, and then I would, if you're looking at doing time derogation, this is a great way to do it. So basically these thicker lines would be buried. Um, and then these smaller spaghetti lines would come off. And generally year one, this is a great thing I picked up from Darren Doherty. Um, I leave all of my uh, irrigation piping exposed. So that way I'm happy with the layout and I'm happy with the distribution. And then after a season, I'll bury it. Uh, but I like having it exposed for that year one, just so I can see how it looks. That doesn't work for everybody's aesthetic, but uh, that's generally how that goes. Michael, uh, thanks for all your questions. Any follow-ups or does that feel good? Just going to stop share so I can see you. Thumbs up. Okay, good. Awesome. Great. Grand. Let's uh, Let's move on. So from David Sato. So David, I'm struggling with completing my assignment on time due to a busy schedule at work and hence some information required from a site such as soil testing isn't able to be collected. Seeking some advice for extension to the next session. Yeah, so for everybody, as we talked about before, all assignments are due on the final date of this class. There are no exceptions. Everything has to be in there. Up to this point, a couple of weeks late, no problem, that's fine. But at the final, uh, the final date, everything has to be in because of the processes that be for OSU. So if you're finding you're behind and you're thinking, I'm not going to finish, I need extra time, you have a couple options. One, you can pay a small fee and re-enroll in the next class or re-enroll in the class that's currently happening. So basically, there's always a class that's happening halfway through the current class. So basically, at the end of this class there'll be another class that's halfway through. And if you wanted to re-enroll in that class, you could, um, if I have space in my roster. And basically we would um, transfer over your grades and then you could just continue posting in the next session that you were um, needing to and that we came to as a class. Um, that could be quite a lot to do. So generally I suggest that people start the next course that's available or a course that makes sense and go from there. You don't have to redo your work. You may want to fine tune it and tweak it and all the rest of it. And then just resubmit um, if you want to, to in, improve your grade or have different feedback because you're, you're available for that. So that works. So David, that's what I would do. And that's true for everybody. The other option is nobody asks for a PDC. You're never going to have a job and someone's going to be like, where's your PDC certificate? It's just not going to happen. Uh, every once in a while, you see people say, well, you know, I'd like it if you had, um, it, it would be preferable if you had a PDC certificate. These are usually um, design companies or people who are, <laughs> who are um, wanting to hire uh, people who have some experience. Um, and that's fine. That's great. But, you know, I've never been asked for mine. So you may not want to go through the process to get your certificate. You may just want to go through the materials at your own pace and uh, not pay the re-enrollment fee and just finish the course at your own leisure. So that's that's another option. 
Woder, last question. I'm trying to figure out the best location for zone one. I'm starting to realize that it may not be a good idea to put food production crops close to the home because I don't want to attract baboons near my house. So I'm playing around with the idea of placing zone one near my zone three above the existing soils. Seems like the most effortless design choice. Any thoughts on this design reasoning? Great. Let's take a look at zones. And then I'm going to go pop over here and take a look at your base map. Then I'm going to shrink my head so I can see what we're talking about. Okay, so zone three above the swales, zone one is around the house. And so the idea is, you know, instead of going around the house, why not go down here? Yeah, uh, that make that might make the most, most sense so that way you don't have pest attractant to the house. Um, I think for things like lettuce, um, any any daily crops, herbs, lettuce, herbs, what else might I pick on a daily basis? I go out to the garden and I'm getting all my lettuces, my kales, my nasturtium flowers, my herbs for cooking. I might put those close to the house and I may uh, I may create one of those um, protected boxes we were talking about um, just so that way I have something close to the house. And then anything that's kind of further from that, kind of your tomatoes, your root crop, especially your root crops can go lower down for sure. But uh, yeah, I might do it that way. I think that's a, that's a good choice specific to your context and specific to what is happening with the baboons. Yeah, that's probably what I do, Woder. Um, good thought, really good design thought. Did you have a follow-up question to that or? Yeah, um, because it, as it, it, currently we have the raised beds there um, at the top, and um, they have already ripped out some crops. I think I think they left lettuces alone, but they um, they did pull up one of our tomato our tomato plants. Um, they did pull up um, in the winter time. They were pulling up, um, I think, kale and other some other leafy greens or carrots and things so yeah but we still don't know what they'll what they'll pull up next so it's still a it's still a um an experiment but um so i guess my thinking was then um what would i then what would i would what would i then, would i then focus the 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 space at the top on you know what would that you know, like I know you were mentioning herbs and things. I mean, I was I was wanting to do the front of the I was the front garden. I wanted to turn it like very focused quite heavily on herbs. Okay. Um, but um, yeah. So that that's the only thing is I don't quite know then what that space should be used for. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's really about your design pra uh, uh, parameters and and your client. Uh, wants and needs so you know generally around site if uh, you're looking to create a more aesthetically driven site so if if you hang around this pool a lot um, what I might do is I might do sort of a pollinator habitat restoration piece here so that way there's a lot of beauty and a lot of flowers and bringing in hummingbirds and butterflies so that way this becomes a a, a real respite it becomes an oasis and things of that nature um it really just depends on what your climate, your your client goals are. Like, what do you want around the site? What are things that you and your family are are wanting? Um. Yeah. I mean, I I I did want to maybe convert the pool into an eco pool or a pond. nice, nice. <laughs> and and also I was because we have that um canal right there. I yep. thought it might would be a really good um easy way to store water. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, so I, I was, yeah. I, so I suppose that the top could be more focused on water storage, and then also, as you said, maybe doing more of a um, a native kind of habitat. Yeah, I would say you know if you're if you're looking to have a little bit more respite area, because obviously the front from your videos and whatnot, isn't really a place to be, but you could convert it into a garden. Um, this back area seems like a pretty good spot to to pull up a book and be out in nature and, and just be in the landscape and observe. So um, I don't know if it's common to have outdoor fires in your area, but I would think, you know, if this was my land, 
I'd probably want to have an outdoor fire pit and maybe an outdoor um, oven to do uh, pizzas and things of that nature. Um, and maybe a couple of hammock setups. Um, you know, generally it would be a, a place to go and relax and be. And, you know, we, we like to play a lot of outdoor games. So I might put in, you know, a horseshoe pit, or this may be where, um, uh, we, we do a lot of archery, um, and, um, knife and hatchet throwing. So I might put something like that here with a good backdrop, you know, just wherever those things that you like to do, um, I might put them close to the house. So it doesn't feel like, oh, we have to walk all the way down to the bottom of the land to go and play whatever. Um, so just generally when we put things closer to the house, we tend to do them more. Right. Yeah, precisely. Um, okay. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, folks. Uh, let's get to check the slides here and check the chat. Okay, we're good. Awesome. All right, everybody. Well, uh, thank you again for great, great questions and great conversations. It's been great pleasure working with all of you. Uh, we're getting towards the end of the course. If you decide that you want to submit plant designs early or zone one designs early or your final design early, you're absolutely welcome to. When I have time, I'm happy to go through it, give you early feedback so that way you can have iterations of it. Um, and then uh, any final questions or thoughts? And as we're coming to the end, you may start to tune your thoughts more to what's next, how to get into design, how to approach design. So, you know, think about that if that's part of why you decide to take the pro course, because we can start to, to steer the conversation that way. All right, folks, great pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, we'll see you as we move further into the course. Hopefully we'll see you in next office hours. Take care, everybody. You're welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. Cheers.